I believe in civic engagement, that the actions of citizens matter, that when the core values of our society or any society are threatened, individuals can join together to protect the civil and human rights that our democracy promises all its citizens and due process protections for all who reside within its borders. You have been invited here because we believe that popular protest requires passion to be effective, but also planning, organizing, training, and discipline. Drawing on the deep expertise of our four gifted leading practitioners, this training on nonviolent organizing, advocacy, and action is an opening act of anticipation that the NYU community, students, administrative professionals, professors, researchers, and friends may well be called upon to engage, perhaps more than any time in the past decades, in the uncharted terrain of political action, of mobilization, and even nonviolent civil disobedience. This is a moment, like I said, of profound moral crisis in this country. It is also one of just tremendous grassroots energy. We have folks showing up in a way that certainly I've never seen in my organizing lifetime. And that's amazing. The question is, how do we develop an effective organizing strategy? Because there's no shortage of issues to work on or things that we could do, right? I'm sure many folks here, you know, if we think about the things that have happened in the last few weeks and months, we think about issues that we care about. So the first thing I'm going to encourage you to do in terms of how to engage effectively in this moment is to think about what issue moves you most. From there, once you've done that, I'm going to suggest do some due diligence. There are a lot of amazing organizations. New York is blessed with a bounty of amazing grassroots organizations. I just put a smattering of them up on, the, up on this slide. So I'm here for Make the Road New York. We're an immigrant rights organization, an organization like New York Communities for Change, which works with us on a number of issues. If you care about inequality, the fight against uh, corporations taking over our government, then maybe you should check out NYCC. You're going to hear from the NYCLU. You're going to hear, well, I don't think we're going to hear from Planned Parenthood for today, but I encourage you to think about who's already engaged in this space and what are they doing. A lot of people are mad as hell, right? And we have to channel that towards a concrete goal. We have to think about what is it that we want to achieve? What is the, and we have to be as specific as we can. This photograph comes from a march that our members decided to hold immediately after the election. They held it five days after the election. There were 15,000 people who showed up in Midtown. And it was to say, aquí estamos y no nos vamos. We are here and we're not going anywhere. And the goal for our membership, particularly on the issue of immigration, we work on a lot of issues, but on the issue of immigration is we are going to fight for our families, and our goal is to keep families together. And when you're thinking about your goals and how to achieve them, we have to think about power. Who, and this could be individuals or entities, who has the ability to influence events and to influence other people? We also have power, right? What the people have demonstrated in the streets and at town halls and in the courtroom have demonstrated in the past month is that there's a lot of bad stuff coming out of Washington, but we can also win because there's a certain power in the people. So when you're thinking about your issue and you've identified what your goal is going to be, my suggestion is to think about a matrix like this and to do a power analysis. So we're going to try to understand power and that's going to inform the strategy that we have and the targets. So we may say, we want to think about who is in our neck of the woods. So you want to think about your targets, and you also want to think about what your strategy is. And by strategy, saying we're going to hold a protest is not a strategy. It's a tactic. And we're going to hear more about the tactics that we want to use. The strategy is how do we achieve our organizing ends? How can we move our targets to achieve the ends that we see as beneficial to our societies and our to our society and our communities. And it might be that you think, okay, I know this particular target who's critical to my campaign, and I know that she responds to corporate pressure. She cares a lot about companies. She cares a lot about finance. And that might lead me to develop a strategy that's focused on corporations. 
corporations or donors or individuals or entities who are complicit, who have said good, who we can pressure to say we are against this and to exercise or to utilize the pressure that they have to move our targets. And what I want you to encourage, I want to encourage you in your own organizing to think about how do we create inter interdependent structures of leadership that are resilient, that have people with, with real roles and who are working and empowering other people. So you have a web of folks who are organizing together. When organizing for human rights, those people whose rights are in question are the only ones who have an urgent and abiding interest in ending those abuses. Importantly, they're the only ones who know the insidious ways that these abuses happen in regularized fashion and know how to correct them. Therefore, by necessity, if we're going to be effective, those are the people that need to be in the driving seat. What do you need to do? You need to engage them. So how do you go about doing that? Well, first of all, you're going to need some educational materials and a style and language that makes sense for each constituency. The kind of materials you're going to put before the Episcopal Church aren't the same that you'll necessarily use to motivate the campus greens. It's best to have constituent leaders to help you develop those materials collaborative. That way, it will make sense in terms of resources, language, and format. Some of this is going to be hard copy. Some of it's going to be electronic. Of course, by now, you all know you need a website or something out there to host your materials, to feature your news, to allow people to sign up and show their support. And while incredible online organizing we have all witnessed, especially in recent years, I want to stress that if you're really about changing things over the long haul, you need to sit down with people face to face. You want to meet them face to face. So organizing is bringing people together. But mobilizing is about moving people to act together. As you're preparing for an action, do some prep on media in that area especially. And you don't have to hit the New York Times. You want to look locally. Do a story about the preparation for the action. That can help advertise what's coming and let people know this fabulous event is going to happen and attract even more people to the work. Now the great thing is when people see you on the move in an action, they get attracted to it. And so in the midst of whatever your direct action is that you're doing, be sure to have ways to sign people up. When you're thinking about something as involved as moving that many people over 14 days, over many miles, and some of you will think of other different sorts of actions that are involved, you have to take seriously your route, the time, the timings of our, how far you're going, or you're not going to make it where you're going, the order of the program, rest stops, food, sleeping arrangements, look at all those logistics up there, right? You've got to think about that when you're planning a big action. Permits, please start early. This process can often take a while. Identify one person from your organization to be your lead liaison. The medical team, you want some people on site who are your own people that can respond to simple first aid or emergencies. And your own security team who can give orders as necessary, help the crowd change direction, and can be resources to be called upon. And they should be really easily identified. Now, if you're planning civil disobedience, I'm going to let my next, the next speaker um, after, excuse me, the final speaker deal with that piece because that's complex. But let me say, if you're planning to go to jail or you're planning to get arrested, you need to think it all the way through, have a plan in place. We have an opportunity to think back over our history in the United States, to not think that we are the first to ever try to do something new. From following the North Star to hunger strikers who went to prison for women's suffrage, from the Edmund Pettus Bridge to Stonewall, we know our ancestors have been there before us. So if we ever doubt that we can make a difference, if we wonder whether it's possible, remember, we have, we can, and we will. Thank you. So what we've developed at the Opportunity Agenda is what we call VPSA. Can you say that with me? VPSA. You guys are so good. So what VPSA stands for is Value, Problem, Solution, Action. Because the number one problem that people do is actually by leading with the problem. 
We don't start with values. And then we don't give people something to do. We don't talk about the solutions. We don't talk about not only a systemic problem, but a systemic solution to that problem and how we can move it forward. But through VPSA, not only can we ground ourselves in values, but we can also tell an affirmative story. We want to talk about positive stories, positive alternatives to the thing that we're fighting against, to the thing that we're working towards, to the country that we actually want to be. I mean, how many of you feel that we're at a critical moment in this country's history where we can actually espouse to those values that our founding fathers claimed to purport? Or we could roll back. We can go right back to where we started. Who do we want to be? So let's break down VPSA a little bit. So the value, the value is essentially, why should somebody care about your issue? Like how are you gonna convince somebody to come over to your side, whether it's your representative, whether it's a family member, with those difficult conversations that we have at family gatherings and Christmas and Thanksgiving and Hanukkah, or it could be someone on social media that you're reaching out to. Why should they care about what you're talking about? They may not feel a personal connection to that story, but let's invite them in. Then we have to talk about the problem. How are we falling short of this value that you have associated with the problem? Why does it matter? Who is implicated in this problem? Who are the people who are affected by it? And who are the policymakers that we can assign responsibility to? Who are the players that we should be holding accountable to find solutions to this problem? So the solutions. You have a systemic problem. You have to talk about the systemic solution. What's going to make this better? How can we fix this? What are you working towards specifically? What is the change that you want to see in the world? And then finally, we have to assign an action. With every protest, with every single call, every petition, every single mo movement and motion that you make towards social justice, you have to activate people. That's why they call us activist. We are activated to move towards action. And in a day and in a time where we are inundated with messages, you have to make it concrete. So I need something that's gonna make it simple. Make it easy for people, lower the barriers, but with every communication that you have, you have to have an action that corresponds with it. Give them something to do. So I'm gonna give you an example of a current movement that has been extremely successful, which is Black Lives Matter. And for me, Black Lives Matter is not only personally important, but it's a great case study for narrative in telling a story because it also shows how an online movement has moved offline and has become a part of the lexicon. You know, Black Lives Matter, if we were to think of it in a different way, is really like a brand. You know, it's something that people kind of want to be associated with now to the point that Fayetteville, Arkansas, there's a population of 80,000 people for Black History Month, put up a banner in their town square that said Black Lives Matter. Now, if that's not progress, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we're using slogans, that we're doing things with, like, such as Black Lives Matter that not only spark conversation, that draw in persuadables, but Black Lives Matter, it's a value. It's a value and it's an action. It's a demand that we want to live in a country where Black Lives Matter. Why do we protest? We protest because we can. Our right to protest, to demonstrate in the streets, is a critical backbone of a functioning democracy. And if we, it's only as strong as, as us going out and doing it. And it is the form of protest that they have no, and they, right, the powers that be, whoever's on your grid of ugly-faced white men, um, <laughs> whoever they happen to be, uh, they, have the, they have the power to put down all kinds of dissent. They have the power to pass laws that stop you at the airport. They have the power to keep you on Rikers Island. Uh, they have the power to cut off your health care, your social services. Um, but they really can't do very much when you're marching in the street. And the things that they can do always make them look bad. So in New York City, you have the right to go out into the streets as long as you stay on the sidewalk and walk with your friends or not your friends or however many people you want and you don't have to tell anybody about it. You don't have to register, you don't have to sign up, you don't have to buy insurance, you don't have to do anything. You could literally, everyone in this room could say, we're gonna march to Stonewall and on the way we're gonna chant how great this lecture was and <laughs> that's it, you could just do it, you could do it right now. Um, the only rule being that you can't block the sidewalk, but as long as you stay on the sidewalk and you don't march on the street and as long as you don't block the sidewalk, you're golden. 
this is one of the most essential and most beloved First Amendment doctrines in, in America, in the United States. The Supreme Court says you can hand out a flyer. And actually, a lot of these cases are from, um, were brought and argued by religious minorities. Um, and so we see how just the act of participating in the First Amendment, participating in dissent, moves the law forward in this area. So what do you need permission for? You can march in the street. If you have permission, you have to get a permit because you could get run over. Um, and you want them to close down the street. So you can get permission from the NYPD to march in the street. Um, but essentially, you could work with your local NYPD precinct to march on any street in New York City um, with a pretty easy permitting process um, that doesn't cost any money. And they pretty much always give you the permit. So you do have to carry an ID if you are a, a documented immigrant. So if you have a visa or a green card, there's federal law that governs what kind of identification you have to carry with you. So if you are in that category and you're not sure, it's a good time to talk to an immigration lawyer and they could tell you exactly, like, look, the law re actually requires you to carry this document with you. If you are a US citizen or you're an undocumented immigrant, you actually are under no legal obligation to carry any ID at any time. Amazing, right? It's amazing. America is an amazing place. We don't have to carry ID. The NYPD can ask you for ID. And if you don't have identification and they feel for some reason that they need to identify you, most usually this is because they think you might have a warrant out for your arrest, um, they actually can take you and will often take you back to the precinct to try to identify you in other ways. This is the task of our age. We may not have chosen it, but you know what? We were born for it. Knowingly or not, we have been preparing for this moment our whole lives. It is ours to meet with courage and strength, and we shall overcome. Thank you so much, and good night.